welcome everyone to, um, I think this is our penultimate, uh, I always like to say that word, our, our second to last uh, lecture in the lecture series this year. Um, and uh, so thanks for joining us this evening at Sound Studies, um, welcome you here. Uh, we're coming to you from Amskwachi, Muskegon, and uh, which is sometimes known as Edmonton, Alberta. We're in Treaty 6 territory, uh, which is the traditional territory of indigenous people, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Inuit, and many others. Uh, today, it's the home of many diverse people, and we welcome you all here, virtual or otherwise. Um, and uh, if this is the first time you've uh, been to one of our events, we're Sound Studies is a research institute at the University of Alberta, and we have a physical home, but this year we've been doing all of our operations um, online, as most people have. Um, but we're a research institute that supports um, creative activities and research that centralizes sound in any way. We're very uh, interdisciplinary. Um, and uh, our, we, um, our, uh, our researchers uh, sometimes work together and sometimes work on their own and discover all kinds of new things together. And so this forum, as well as many others, are places where um, many of our affiliates um, talk about their work. So um, when we, uh, as we put together next year's um, series of, of talks, you'll see that some of those uh, some of those lectures are our affiliates. But we also invite people who are um, related to us or connected to us in some way or have interesting work that we like to feature. Um, and uh, um, we're excited uh, to have our deal Reese here tonight. Um, I want to say a special thanks to Oliver Rossier, Tom Merklinger, and Gail Mendrick uh, for their support um, in helping me run the, the Research Institute. And uh, just to let you all know that this um, event is being recorded for future audiences. Um, and uh, so at the end, if you're uh, wanting to ask a question and would prefer not to have your image um, or a voice recorded or anything like that, you can put your question uh, in the chat. And as you know, right now you're all muted. Um, but uh, at the end, when we're ready to open it up for questions, we'll give you the opportunity to speak if you'd like to or put your question in the chat. Um, and we'll be monitoring that by looking at raised hands or um, other methods for letting us know that you have a question. So we're looking forward to that. So um, uh, in this, uh, this evening, we're gonna be um, talking about choral music um, in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, and we, we have, we're, we're happy to welcome our guest um, this evening, an associate professor and director of music uh, at the University of Alberta's Augustana faculty, our, one of our sister institutions. Um, Ardell was raised in Alberta prairies and surrounded by art, poetry, music, and nature with a passion for singing, uh, musical inclusion, multi-generational musical education. Ardell teaches musicianship theory, conducting choral literature courses, music education, applied voice, and music and wellness courses. That's a mouthful right there. <laughs> so she does a lot. Um, she's a staunch, staunch advocate for uh, Canadian choral music um, and has commissioned premiered choral works uh, from established and emerging Canadian composers. She's also the editor uh, of the second edition of Reflections of Canada, a compilation of a cappella Canadian folk songs arranged for choirs. Uh, and she also uh, has a partner named Roger Admiral, who is a pianist. Um, and I want to say, and I'll mention this again at the end, but uh, our very last lecture, um, which will be followed by a concert of piano music, uh, Roger Admiral will be, will be playing. Uh, some compositions by uh, composers at the University of Alberta, including myself, and also Gordon Fitzell, who will be our final speaker on the series next in, in two weeks. So I'll tell you more about that at the end. But uh, without further ado, uh, let's hear about Sing Singable, um, the University of Alberta's multi-generational in inclusion choir, and welcome uh, our Dale Reese. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much, Scott, um, for your kind words. And it's a, such a, an honor to be here to present for the U of A Sound Studies Institute. Um, and um, I see um, little gray squares on my screen with lots of names and many names that I recognize. And I just want to thank you for being here. And I see such supportive colleagues here and uh, choristers past and present, as well as students past and present. And I do see um, one particularly important person here who's present, and that's my inspirational mentor. And that's uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Leonard Ratzlaff, who is here. So thank you for being here, all of you. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, just get onto my screen here uh, and share a little bit. 
Um, and I hope you can see this okay. Uh, thumbs up, you can see this okay? I hope so. Um, so um, here we go. Uh, so um, the first thing I thought we needed to do is just take a little trip down memory lane. And uh, you can see here uh, on this image that we have uh, March 10, 2020. And I'm sure that uh, most likely you can all remember exactly where you were during that fateful week in March 2020. I think the 9th of March was a Monday, the 10th of March was a Tuesday. And um, this particular image actually was taken from a slide that I used at a choir rehearsal that Tuesday evening. And um, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit of a story from that fateful week in March. Um, Roger and I had just returned from Portland, Oregon, where I was uh, presenting at an Organization of American Kodai Educators Conference. And on the evening of March 10, my uh, choir was preparing to host a very large community singing event in our community. Um, and it would have happened on the 14th of March. And this particular event was to celebrate uh, uh, World Music Heals Month. And um, so uh, we, at that rehearsal, we sang, um, oopsie, I have to go back here. We sang a German folk tune. Uh, music alone shall live, that um, in retrospect, we had no idea how the words from this folk song um, would, would uh, kind of challenge us in so many ways. Um, and it was perhaps a little bit um, prescient of, uh, or a fervent plea um, that we were putting into the universe. We had no idea um, what was happening because of those singing super spreader events and such. And so as I look back to one year ago, I thought, you know, maybe we need to sing this right now. And so um, I invite you in true COVID-19 choral tradition, perhaps none of you have experienced this, but um, of course what we need to do, um, ironically, you have to mute, mute your microphones and your microphones are already muted as it is. But we are going to sing this and um, this is a canon. Uh, and uh, I, I invite you to sing it in, in canon, although when I sing it, I'm going to be pulling the tempo a little bit just because it is, it is um, something that we're hoping for the future as we advocate for whatever the future will be um, in this very different world. <clears throat> so we'll start here. And all things shall perish from under the sky. Music alone shall live, music alone shall live, music alone shall live, never to die. So as I said, uh, looking back and realizing that we had sung it at that time um, kind of makes one pause, shall we say. So as we as we move on, um, I'll just... Uh, uh, think a little bit again about that uh, week in March and um, perhaps um, as residue from that Kodai conference that uh, Roger and I had attended um, and you know I'm as you know and as Scott had mentioned I'm a staunch proponent um, of, uh, of uh, music ed education uh, uh, advocacy and activities and uh, specifically the ideas of Hungarian composer, ethnomusicologist, linguist, music educator, and philosopher Zoltán Kodály. And um, so this, this quote is indeed appropriate. While singing in itself is good, the real reward comes to those who sing, who feel and think with others. This is what harmony means. We must look forward to the time when all people in all lands are brought together through singing and when there is universal harmony. So he wrote these words in the 1940s and uh, so now they, they take on a particular significance. And then uh, something else I just wanted to, as we're reflecting on the state of singing today um, within this global pandemic, um, uh, this uh, quote comes from a new book that was written by John Colapinto, who's a Canadian journalist who works in the United States. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this book, but if you are um, uh, interested at all in the dealings of anything to do uh, with the voice, it is entitled, This is the Voice. And so um, as we try to make sense of our loss of sing-ability in this mediated, muffled, or muted world, um, these words really have an impact. 
Speech and song are equally an assertion of our existence against the void, a means for animating the air with news of our presence, however ephemeral, and thus should be performed with confidence in the self and with an awareness of the music from which our linguistic capability arose. So project your voice without fear or favor. Weaponize it should the legitimate need arise. Soften it when the mood calls for it, but be aware of its full, fantastic range of expression and revel in it. So this is perhaps a little, a little uh, tribute to the voice, um, or maybe it's not so little. So as for, um, as for tonight, um, here's a little overview of what, what um, I will speak about. Um, for the first 30 minutes or so, um, I would like, I'll summarize some frameworks and foundations that support the idea of sing-ability and the sing-able project that I've been involved with over the last three years. So we're going to be talking about musical identity, singing identity, the notion of ableism, community music, health music, inclusion choirs, and large communities. And then we will culminate with um, some, some uh, words about uh, uh, the project that I've been involved with, the sing Able project that was started in 2018. So we're also going to sing, and we have sung already. And like I said, I'm just seeing the gray boxes, and I do hope that you are engaging in singing uh, when, when uh, the time comes. So I really encourage you to do so. Um, so um, just I'm going to introduce you to someone. Some, and Scott had mentioned Roger already. Um, Roger, for those of you who don't know him, uh, he is um, my partner in life and in music. And as Scott had mentioned, he's a pianist. Uh, he, Roger has supported me um, for decades now. And at Augustan, he's a pr professor of piano theory, history, composition, and uh, he's a wonderful collaborator. And uh, he's just on the piano behind me because we're going to sing together. Uh, but before we sing, we're going to do a little bit of moving. All right. And if you happen to be in a room with two people, you can do what is going to be a, a hand jive. You could do it together with your partner. Or if you're alone, uh, we've got this kind of, um, we've got some patterns here with some symbols. And so if we look at the bottom where there's four asterisks and we have a patch, clap, together, clap, if you are with someone in a room, or if you're not, you would go patch, clap, and snap clap. You see that there's an asterisk with, or there's only three asterisks, and there you will be patch, clap, and snap. Two asterisks are tap and snap, and one asterisk is snap. And you can see you can either do something together with your partner, if there's someone in the room with you. Um, we, if we go up on the left side here, we've got patch, clap, and together, or clap together, or the, with one asterisk is just a high five. So that's kind of a pattern that is going to go together with a particular song that's going to get us in the mood for what's to come. And so here we have it, Joe Raposo's Sing from 1971. I'm sure that you will all be, well, most of you um, of a particular generation will be, uh, will be familiar with this tune. Uh, this tune has been uh, translated into about 40 different languages, including American Sign Language. And uh, as, as we consider the text of this song, it is, I believe, the true enabling song. All right. Um, uh, don't worry that it's not good enough for anyone else to hear. We just need to sing and sing a song. So uh, you'd have to feel the pulse somewhere in your in your body, and then you see where the asterisks are happening, and you'll um, fit in this this little uh, pattern of our our body percussion. So Roger's going to take it away, and here we go. Ready? Sing. Sing a song, sing out loud, sing out strong, sing of good things, not bad, catch, clap, snap, clap, sing of happy, not sad, sing. Sing a song, make it simple to last your whole life long. Don't worry that it's not good enough for anyone else to hear. 
just sing, sing a song. La 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 Sing, sing a song. Let the world sing along. Sing of love there could be. Sing for you and for me. Sing, sing a song. Make it simple to last your whole life long. Don't worry that it's not good enough for anyone else to hear. Just sing, sing a song. Just sing. Sing a song, just sing, sing a song. And then we need, of course, within your gray boxes, some jazz hands. Okay, thank you for singing, and I hope that your spirits are lifted. And um, now we're going to take you to Camrose, Alberta. For those who have never been to Camrose, uh, this is where um, we are situated with the University of Alberta Augustana campus, the liberal arts uh, faculty of the University of Alberta. And our campus is home to a vibrant, over a, seven, over a century uh, uh, old choral tradition. And our campus has four choirs. We've got the Augustana Choir conducted by Dr. John Weeb, Song Corps, a women's choir also conducted by Dr. John Weeb, Mons Corps uh, also conducted by uh, Dr. John Weeb, our, our men's choir. And um, then our newest uh, choir within our cohort is Sing Able. And uh, in the 2019-2020 academic year prior to March, um, these choirs were a singing home for over 200 choristers. And so um, now we're just going to head into some theory, okay, a little bit of um, supporting information about the Sing Able project. And uh, the first uh, thing is uh, the notion of musical identity. And this term or concept was coined by British researchers MacDonald, Hargraves, and Miel uh, in the early 2000s. And um, basically, everyone has some kind of musical identity. And with this umbrella of what we call musical identity, there's kind of two ways to consider it. We can think about music in identities, that is how music defines us. So for example, um, if we uh, consider that someone uh, listens to country music, we kind of have an impression of that person. Or if someone sings in a choir, we have another impression of that person. So that's music in identity. Or we can think about identity in music, and that is what we consider ourselves to be in music and what we are in music or um, what we are not. It's our self-perception of our um, abilities. And along with this notion of musical identity, we can think about musical self-esteem, musical self-image, um, and uh, throughout our lives, social groups exert a powerful influence and define our musical identity. And oftentimes we'll compare ourselves with others, and um, you know we can we can see how we can rate in terms of this musical activity on musical identity, and this um, can either uh, encourage us or it can actually um, give rise to some incongruity or even some distress and maybe a lowered musical self esteem. Uh, family and school contexts play a crucial role in developing musical identity and um, musical self-esteem. And um, uh, for children, uh, it is thought that between the ages of five and 14, that these are really influential times in the musical environment. And so the family and social setting um, is really, um, it plays a, a huge impact in, into how a musical identity is established. Or um, uh, we can think about how, our, um, how we either move towards music or move away from, from music. And um, I think you've probably all heard of the idea of script theory, where 
um, in our family of origin that family members are key in, divine, in, in defining what our musical identity is. So if we roll along um, thinking about musical identity, I'm going to um, introduce you to some ideas from music therapists. Um, and these, uh, new, uh, these two particular uh, uh, music therapists, they began a a kind of approach to music therapy called the Nordoff Robbins approach to music therapy. And uh, Paul Nordoff was an American uh, composer and music therapist, and Clive Robbins was a British music therapist. And they worked together to develop an approach that's rooted in the belief that every child has the potential to respond to music, regardless of adverse conditions, challenges, or illness. And this potential is called the music child. That was their that was their description. And the music child is in uh, we can say in contrast to a conditioned child. A conditioned child displays um, learned behaviors um, as opposed to the natural or innate behaviors, which um, Nordoff and Robbins believed um, was this um, innate musicality. And so um, the music child is the individualized musicality inborn in every child. Um, and the term has reference to the universality of human musical sensitivity. And um, uh, Nordoff and Robbins, they particularly, they, they work particularly with children. And um, so again, they believe that everyone responds to music in some ways. It affects our minds, our bodies, and our feelings. And so they believe that with children, um, they should have the opportunity to play and create um, through spontaneous music making or improvisation. And that this experience would allow children to creatively express their thoughts, their ideas, their feelings, and improve physical health health and ability, and, and maybe address um, emotional behavioral uh, difficulties, develop communication and social skills, and increase creativity, self-esteem, and confidence. Um, and so in line with this thinking of Nordoff and and Robbins, we can also think um, how this aligns perfectly with the philosophy of seminal music educators throughout history, such as Emile Jacques Delcroze, Zoltan Kodai, Lowell Mason, um, and Karl Orff, the idea of music child, and uh, within that, a notion of musical identity. So, um, I've kind of taken this and moved it beyond. And rather than thinking about this specifically for children, we need to extend it and think about this simply as the music human versus the conditioned human, that every individual can respond to and engage in music. And um, I thought I'd kind of bring these ideas back to the notion of singing. And uh, I've taken a quote from Andrew Lee. Andrew Lee is a professor of music therapy and coordinator of the music therapy program at Wilfrid Laurier University. And uh, he was a student of the Nordoff Robbins technique or approach to music therapy. And he writes, singing was the ever present metaphor for living and transcendence and singing was at the heart of Nordoff and Robin's work. So I'm just bringing it back to the notion of, of singing at the heart of, of this kind of work. Um, so if we think about uh, uh, singing identity and um, uh, musical identity and then moving it in, 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 uh, the, in the direction of singing identity, I wonder, and um, I don't have my chat up here, but I would just love to know um, if you wanted to write uh, how you feel about your singing voice in the, in the chat. But um, I was just thinking if I asked you that could you could you say that you love your singing voice and are confident at all times singing in in any context? And I would I would think that potentially that no matter how well trained we are, we um we always have this sense of vulnerability with our voices, and so we have our singing self esteem, we have a singing self image and a singing identity. And again, the family and school context play crucial roles in developing this singing identity and self esteem. And um, again, we develop our own kind of script theory um, uh, in terms of our singing identity. Uh, and then if we continue to consider the voice, um, Diane Austin is a vocal psychotherapist um, in the United States, and she's written a number of wonderful, wonderful books um, about, about the human voice. And um, her therapy, um, her approach, is one that uses the voice um, uh, to uh, 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 
help with self-discovery, to help with self-expression, and to help um, to cope with inner struggles and turmoil. And uh, Diane Austin writes that um, the voice is the most intimate instrument. And so for all of you who sing, you, 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 you know this. Um, it connects us to both the inner and outer worlds. And if we think about our voices, um, our voices are very, very um, sensual in that um, we, what is inside of us, we express in an outward way. And that expression enters someone's, someone's ear. And so it's this, this um, beautiful uh, connection between, between what our, our mouth on our voice and our listening. Um, it is a primary source of bonding. It expresses our essential and unique self. And it is a source, as I mentioned before, of extreme vulnerability. Um, and so... Uh, we'll continue moving along. We've talked about musical identity. We've talked about singing identity. And now we're going to take a moment and examine um, uh, ex exclusion or ableism. And we're going to uh, examine this within the context of Western European culture. So I write, in Western culture, participation and music and the arts in general is typically exclusionist or ableist in nature, largely dependent on hierarchy, on audition and competition with reference for those who have been identified as gifted or talented. Um, and uh, I, I uh, just wanted to bring uh, your attention to some thoughts of uh, uh, internationally regarded music educator from the United States. His name is David, David Myers. Um, and uh, he's a proponent of innovation in higher music education. He works at the University of, of Minnesota in the realm of, of music education. And uh, he developed a um, partnership. He used to be in, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and he developed a partnership between um, Georgia State University, the Atlanta, uh, Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, community musicians, and inner city schools. That was his work in terms of innovation. And uh, so he writes... Uh, that we must, as music edu educators, interrogate the profession at large about its assumptions on which programs are based, and to understand how intersections of music, learning, creativity, and a variety of individual and social experiences may form a composite of opportunities that include all children and all adults of all generations and cultures at all times and places. So as music educators, we need to constantly reconsider and reimagine our practices as the world changes around us. And so there has to be constant pedagogical renewal and evolution in everything that we do. Uh, as we continue along thinking about uh, frameworks and foundations, we've gone from identity for singing, or for music in general, and singing in, uh, uh, specifically, and then have um, looked at uh, what happens with ableism. The next thing that I'd like to just touch upon is the notion of community music. And um, uh, the, the movement, our concept and academic discipline of community music was established roughly 20 years ago and in the UK. And Professor Lee Higgins is the director of the International Center of Community Music based um, at York St. John University in the UK. And um, as a community musician, he has worked across the education sector as well as within health settings, prison and probation service, um, and arts organizations such as orchestras and dance. And so basically he has come up with three definitions of what community music could be considered to be. Um, community music could be thought of as music of a particular community. Uh, community music could be communal music making or uh, community music could be an active intervention between a music leader and, and participants. Uh, and so in terms of community music, um, although community music practices often exist outside of a formal or institutionalized curriculum, and this has been going on for for, um, for, for um, decades or centuries, we could even say, um, uh, community music leaders uh, really need to be guided. And um, so right now, degrees in community music exist at Wilfrid Laurier University. You can get a, match, uh, a master's of arts um, uh, in community music or a bachelor of music in community music at Wilfrid Laurier University. And um, Lee Higgins, he has a wonderful, um, wonderful, uh, uh, 
uh, list of qualities of leaders within the community music making movement, which I'll, I'll just read to you. Um, a leader within this movement must commit to the idea that everybody has the right and ability to make, create, and enjoy their own music. Uh, a leader should seek to enable accessible music making opportunities for members of the community. A leader should seek to foster confidence in participants' creativity. Uh, the leader should recognize that participants' social and personal growths are as important as their musical growth. Um, that the leader must be committed to lifelong musical learning that the leader must put emphasis on the variety and diversity of musics that reflect and enrich the cultural life of the community, the locality of the individual participants. And uh, then an, a leader must be particularly aware of the need to include disenfranchised and disadvantaged individuals or groups. And finally, um, the leader should recognize the value and use of music to foster intercultural acceptance and understanding. Uh, so, uh, when we think about community music, there is a branch of community music that is um, actually officially called community music therapy. And uh, another term that I wanted to bring to your attention was the term health music, health musicking. And uh, these things, these two um, particular branches, uh, Evan Rudd is a professor of American Professor Emeritus of Music Education and Music Therapy at the Norwegian Academy of Music. He has really done a lot of writing on community music therapy. And um, another uh, Scandinavian, or the, another Norwegian, Bryn, Brynjolf Stiege from the University of Bergen, has um, coined the term health musicking. And the definition of health musicking is health affordances, affordances within musical practice, okay? The benefits of, of um, health um, that connect with musical practice. And if we think back to, um, to uh, uh, Evan Rudd's um, ideas about community music therapy, um, uh, community music therapy uh, builds community and when this con within this context bears relation to community music therapy with a number of goals. Artistic endeavor as a community service. The whole community is involved in music rituals connected with healing. Um, community music therapy is sensitive to cultures and contexts. Um, music, community music therapy or CMT elicits solidarity and social chain. Change builds identity, empowerment and agency and promotes health and mutual caring. So those concepts are really important um, as a foundation for the work that we've been doing with Sing Able. We'll now move then to the notion we've gone, you know, with community, community music, uh, community music therapy, then brings us naturally to community choirs. And uh, Diana Yerachuk, uh, she's actually um, an alum of, of uh, U of A. Uh, she is now an assistant or maybe associate professor, I think, at Wilfrid Laurier University in the community music program. And she wrote a dif dissertation um, about, about inclusion choirs and community choirs. And so she defines community choirs as voluntary recreational spaces. And um, in terms of her ideas um, and her uh, uh, definitions that connect with inclusion choir, and if we think about the word inclusion, this is a broad term that has been more and more frequently used since the 1970s, when the United Nations created a Declaration of Human Rights for Individuals with Disability. And so um, when we think about inclusion and uh, we think about uh, uh, opportunity to participate, to be recognized, to be respected and to belong. And so then we put that within a choral context. Um, we have a choral context where we are encouraging our choristers um, to participate, to be recognized, respected and to belong within our, our musical context. Um, uh, uh, inclusion choir practices were established um, initially in the in the UK, and um, there are all all um, different kinds all around the world. We have prison choirs that. Uh, multicultural choirs, homeless choirs for the homeless, gender neutral choirs, pub choirs, self professed non singer choirs, social justice choirs, intergenerational and multi generational choirs, neurodiverse choirs, and threshold choirs. These are all, all groups that are, are um, encouraging um, uh, participation, recognition, and belonging. 
And uh, within Canada, uh, we have many, many inclusion choirs. And I'm, I'll kind of go from coast to coast and, and show you ex um, some examples. There's the Lauda Neurodiverse Choir in St. John's, Newfoundland, that's connected with the work of Kelly Walsh. The Acu Bono Choir of Montreal was a choir for homeless men. Um, uh, and it was so su successful that actually uh, the men that were in the choir um, are, are no longer homeless. And so um, the, choir, um, the choir no longer exists exists. Um, we've got the Tamir Nishama Choir uh, in Ottawa that is a choir for individuals with developmental disabilities. The Intergenerational Choir Project that was started by Dr. Our Professor Emeritus Dr. Carol Bynan uh, in London, Ontario. Um, and this choir was, was established um, in honour of, of Kenneth Fleet, who was an influential uh, conductor in London, Ontario, and who um, was battling uh, uh, Alzheimer's. And so this was, this was a project that put together dementia patients uh, with high school students. The Momentum Choir in St. Catharines, Ontario, conducted by Mendelt Hoekstra, is um, a choir that is solely for individuals with disability. Choir, Choir, Choir in Toronto is a pub inclusion choir. The Common Thread Community Chorus is a social justice choir, and uh, Deanna Yurichuk uh, studied them for her doctoral dissertation. Braille Tones in Edmonton, uh, founded by Scott Leadhead as part of the Cocapelli organization, uh, now conducted by Susan Farrell. They were actually one of the first inclusion choirs in our country. Uh, we have Choral Morphosis in Edmonton that's currently uh, conducted by Noah Wright, uh, a music student in, the, in uh, the Department of Music at the North Campus. And I think the Choral Mor Morphosis maybe was founded by Tammy Jo Mortensen. We've got the Cool Choir in Calgary that I think has about 300 members, members and they sing rock music. And uh, Voices in Motion in Victoria, um, uh, and that should be Victoria, BC, not Victoria, Alberta. But anyway, um, we've got uh, Voices in Motion that's currently conducted by Erica Fairberg. And Voices in Motion is similar to the Intergenerational Choir Project in London, Ontario, in that, um, again, uh, the choir, the Voices in Motion Choir focuses on individuals with, with dementia and then focuses on high school students and put those two generations together. That's just a little swath of inclusion choirs across our country. Um, and I just thought I'd do a little uh, review of the of the definition of intergenerational choirs as opposed to multi-generational. And the intergenerational choir, as I described with the moment uh, with the um, uh, intergenerational choir project in London and the Voices in Motion in Victoria, it's putting two generations together. Uh, and then a multi-generational ensemble is one that as the name implies, has many generations that are involved. And this can be connected if you want to think about family singing, when we have our grandparents and the parents and the grandchildren together all singing. So that is the multi-generational um, uh, definition. Uh, so uh, as we continue along on thinking about frameworks and foundations, uh, I just wanted to um, go back to the idea of ableism. Uh, or disableism, if we want to think about it in those kind of terms. But our thoughts turn to Jean Vanier. Um, and as you know, um, Jean Vanier, uh, he's a Canadian, uh, that lived, he spent most of his life in France. Uh, he's a philosopher, theologian, humanitarian advocate for individuals with disability. And um, he established uh, communities called L'Arche Communities. L'Arche uh, is translated as the Ark. And these communities are characterized by mutual relationships of friendship, care, and compassion between people with and without uh, in, an intellectual disability. And so um, these friendships are lived out through sharing daily life with, and um, uh, basically Jean Vanier wanted to remove individuals with disability from uh, care facilities and put them together uh, in society so that they were not um, pushed away and pushed apart. And um, so uh, Jean Vanier established a number of these communities um, all around the world. There are a number in, in Canada, and uh, Jean Vanier, he, he writes, and this is something that conductors can really think about um, uh, in our work with uh, inclusion, um, he urges leaders to develop their ability for listening to people who are different. Um, and uh, sadly, for those of you who, who, um, who have followed the work of Jean Vanier, um, 
he died in 2019 and then was posthumously accused of sexual abuse um, with some of his the people that worked for him, um, which which really was heartbreaking for um, those who have really followed and um, revered uh, him. And he has done so much good work. And so that was a very sad, very sad turn of events. Um, so now uh, that was the theory part of my lecture, and uh, we're now going to talk specifically about the Sing Able project and uh, the genesis of this project. And uh, in 2017, the uh, University of Alberta Augustana campus was home to the 23rd International Kodai Symposium, and this symposium was an international symposium um, for music educators and our our uh, theme was to examine music education from the time of birth to the time of death, from birth to adult, and um, uh, looking at this broad examination of lifelong learning and the lifelong application of Kodai's ideas that music is for everyone. Music is spiritual food for everyone. So that was our our um, our intent behind that behind that conference, and. Um, our conference was was really um, very successful. We had about 300 people from all around the world that that visited Camrose, and um, so at the end we uh, we ended up with a significant uh, pool of funds that were um, uh, split between the Alberta Kodai Association, the Kodai Society of Canada, and our Augustana campus. And um, so we decided at Augustana that the best thing that we need to do is invest in some kind of initiative um, in our community. Um, that would promote um, lifelong music making. And um, this kind of happened at the same time that um, I was struck with a hereditary autoimmune illness. Um, and that actually happened a number of years before 2017. And so I went through a period of real stark musical identity crisis. And um, I spent a long time uh, when I was ill, um, really thinking about notions of musical identity, about in exclusion about inclusion in relation to those who are frequently marginalized from music making, especially those who believe that they cannot participate in music, that they cannot sing, or in my case in those days um, as a choral conductor, who could not? Who could not? Um, who could not conduct? Um, so these things were all kind of in my in my mind. Um, and then we did the conference. And um, in the year of the conference, I got a telephone call from the Cameras Association for Community Living. It's a local metropolitan organization dedicated dedicated to integrating individuals mm -hmm. with disability into the community. And so I got a telephone call from the executive director and one of their staff members, and they asked if we would be interested, if the, our, the university would be interested to start some kind of ensemble for individuals with disability. And so it was just this wonderful synergy of, of um, ideas floating in the universe that I was kind of thinking of along those lines about what it meant to be, to have a disability and not be able to participate fully in music making. And then they called and asked if we wanted to put something like that together. And so um, it all kind of worked out beautifully and Sing Able was born. So it's a town and gown partnership. Um, uh, Sing Able is um, a multi-generational uh, choir and the choir is a choir that is modeled on these uh, groups, these inclusion choirs that I mentioned before. And I was particularly um, I was so grateful to Carol Bynan from uh, London, Ontario with her intergenerational choir project. She invited me there and I, I watched those rehearsals and also Susan Farrell with Braille Tones in Edmonton to learn about, about how one can put such groups together. So our group is multi-generational. We invite all, uh, all abilities or individuals with disability, regardless of socioeconomic status, the choir is free. And again, uh, it's the connection between our university community and the community at large. And um, our tagline is, we love to sing because we are able. Uh, here is a beloved photo taken in the uh, in, in the month of December 2019, uh, obviously, you know, three months before the pandemic struck. And so there we are at Christmas after a carol sing in the Augustana Chapel. And up in the right hand corner, you're going to see the evidence of our multi-generational uh, cohort where we have a great grandmother, we have a grandmother, and we have a mother and children. Um, and uh, so that's just a little portrait of Sing Abel. 
in terms of um, objectives and outcomes, um, we have based this on, on notions of music co cognition and response to music. Um, through the choir, we want to engender optimism and positive feelings. We want to raise self-esteem and self-confidence, create a sense of real belonging and community, increase communication skills, boost concentration, um, improve um, memory, increase cross-generational discourse, um, enhance our reading and listening skills with music, increase awareness, change perceptions, and build community connections between a diverse group of individuals and provide opportunity for self-expression. Um, I'm going to show you a video and um, this video um, was prepared uh, the, in our first year of that we were established. We were very grateful um, that the Alberta Council of Disability Services um, gave uh, Sing Able an award for innovative programming uh, within the uh, province of Alberta. And so I'm going to show you a little video that takes you into a glimpse into Sing Able's activities. And this will set a framework um, uh, for what Sing Able is, this multi generation inclusion choir. The goal of Singable is to provide community members of all ages and stages of life, including those with disabilities and with exceptionalities, uh, and their caregivers with the opportunity to explore and express their musical talents in a meaningful and rewarding way through singing. Singable as an inclusion choir also brings together uh, individuals who are traditionally marginalized from the world of music making and brings them together with a supportive community of others who are usually involved in music making and together we can build a really powerful musical impact. When we started Sing Able, at our first rehearsal, I expected maybe there would be 30 people that would come, but Sing Able has grown to a group that would include about 100 individuals. Sing Able consists of individuals from the ages of 10 weeks old through to 86 years of age, and there's everyone in between. Uh, visits from seniors choirs in our community. We've had visits from a local chamber choir, a number of volunteers from our student body, a local children's choir, groups from schools, and they come and they, they sing with us. They gain awareness about the di diversity within our group and I, I think appreciation for the diversity within our group. And then they also have an opportunity to share their music with us so that we can hear other forms of, other forms of music making. Sing Able is for everyone and it is about um, musical expression. Why do we love to sing? Yeah. I think I love to sing because it reminds me of being a little girl in church and it just brings those good feelings back and it's something that I, I love to do and I like the fact that it's inclusive. Yeah, everybody can come, right? Right. <laughs> good. This year we have written a, a song that we have, in, have decided is our theme song. The Sing Able song is the song that I think best expresses much of what I had hoped would be the outcome of this, this project. Uh, we sing because we are able. We raise our voices proud and strong. And when we sing together without label, we are singers and this is our song. 
that I think really says it all. And also to, to um, see our individuals working together to write the lyrics for that song, I felt was a beautiful and poetic symbol of, of what, what this project is all about. And as someone has said from our local Rotary Club, uh, it would be wonderful if society worked in the manner in which Singable does, where we appreciate everyone and we reach out to everyone and support everyone in the best way that we possibly can. So that just gives you a little snapshot of what, what um, our, our project is all about. Um, uh, when it came to thinking about preparation for Singable, um, I have been brought up in, uh, from, from I think probably my, my teens, I've been brought up in this ableist world when it comes to music making. And I had never really, I never worked with individuals with disability. I'd worked with children's choirs, adult choirs, all, everything was with audition. And so um, I had to do, when I, when I realized that I was going to take something like this on, it was a very humbling experience. And I, I really had to learn everything that I possibly could about inclusion inclusion arts, inclusion choirs, and um, I took some music therapy courses. And so, um, I mean, it's all an evolving, evolving um, uh, journey um, as, as we work in this realm. And as I said, I'm really grateful to Carol Bynan and Susan Farrell um, from uh, first Carol from the University, um, Western University, and the founder of the Interge Intergenerational Choir Project, and then to Susan Farrell with Braille Tones, um, as they, they have worked for years in that capacity. I, in terms of practice and pedagogy, um, uh, Singable uh, has a predictable rehearsal structure. It's important um, uh, with our community that we have um, much repetition and that people know what to expect. Um, we always start with the meet and greet. We have a musical ter territorial acknowledgement. We do, as any other choir, physical and vocal warm-ups. We modify, obviously, for those uh, who may have um, mobility issues. Um, exercises to assist with vocal development, uh, skill development, uh, the music that we do, um, um, uh, the songs have well-defined melody, simple rhythmic structures drawn from folk, gospel, camp songs, hymns, popular songs. We do part singing, movement and dance, improvisation, rhythm instruments, rhythm and melody, composition, improvisation. We do a wide variety of things during our time together. We um, ask the, the singers to suggest songs that they would like that we could sing together or else we can share songs that we uh, listen from recordings. Um, as mentioned, um, performing groups, and I see that Joanne Murphy is here on, on, the, on, the, on the session and Joanne's chamber choir came and performed for us, but also sang with us. And so performing groups in our community, we bring them to um, sing able um, when we were able back before 2020. We always end with a musical blessing. And then, of course, one of the most important things is to have social time because it, as we want to try to build bridges with community. So that's kind of our, our practice and, and pedagogy. Um, uh, this is not a performing choir, and this I made very clear from the very beginning. I wanted that, that we focus on the process over the product. And um, there are times, yes, when we have been asked to sing uh, for a rotary club or for other, other uh, occasions within our community back when we could have live performances. And um, uh, uh, it, it's a such an uh, uh, approach for me that I always say that if you're going to ask us to sing for whatever event, that everyone at that event is going to sing. It will not just be sing able singing. Um, and um, we structure our year around um, things like, uh, rather than performances, we structure them around community singing. So we celebrate World Singing Day in October. We have Community Carol Sings in December. We celebrate Music Heals Awareness Month. We just celebrated that a couple of weeks ago with the Zoom community sing. And then we do 
um, we do composition projects and improvisation as well. Um, within our connection with the university, uh, we have a lot of possibilities um, uh, for cross-disciplinary connection with uh, music education, with psychology, with kinesiology, and on our liberal arts campus, we have uh, music students, we have psychology students, kinesiology students, and so um, there's lots of opportunity um, for undergraduate student research when they're involved with Singable. We're now able to offer undergraduate credit for such students who want to participate with, with Singable. We have community service learning opportunities for undergraduate students and obviously volunteer um, opportunities as well. In terms of research that has been done, in 2019, we conducted a very kind of informal survey uh, with both individuals with disability with the choir and those general community members. Um, I was I had started to do some research on L'Arche um, and Jean Vanier and the connection with music, but then with all the kind of the things that came to light um, with Jean Vanier, that's kind of been put on the on the back burner for a bit. But I would like to delve into that again. Uh, last spring, we were going to do a, 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 a creative um, some creative research into a graphic notation project, which also was shelved because of because of um, COVID. And then uh, coming up this fall, we're going to be in partnership with the University of British Columbia and a research project that involves Voices in Motion, the intergenerational choir for individuals with disability, uh, dementia, and high school students. We're going to be collaborating with them in the fall. Um, uh, this we just some of our um, results from this informal study that that I told you about uh, that happened a couple of years ago. Um, we we interviewed um, individuals with disability as well as our our other other individuals within the choir just to get a sense of what their impressions were with with the choir um, and their experiences after our first year of of existence. And so um, uh, uh, there was a hundred percent who enjoyed the multi generational singing aspect. This, these are our individuals with disability from this particular part of the questionnaire. Um, they felt that they felt um, uh, different after singing in the choir. Um, and they had some kind of self-awareness about singing and learning about others. So those are just some kind of uh, brief uh, summary of this rather informal uh, uh, research ethics board approved um, a survey. And then the, this was the results from some of our community choristers. Um, learned about diversity through the music rehearsed, um, the multi-generational focus affects singable in a positive way, noticed physical, intellectual, emotional, or spiritual change before, during, or after singable rehearsals. And um, so those were just some of our results from, from that survey. Um, I just have here a few slides about our composition project when we wrote our theme song. So I just th thought I'd throw a few things there if any of you have any questions about process with such, such a thing. Um, uh, and uh, we then um, were thinking about doing a performance art project, was talking about this um, creative, creative research that we were going to do last spring. Uh, we were going to put together visual art and music and improvisation, um, having canvases where the, the individuals we were going to have some painting uh, that, that we would create in our rehearsals and then put together this kind of performance art where we would sing the paintings and then in between we'd sing songs about the elements of um, the earth, of the wind, water, and fire. But again, uh, COVID has put a stop to that. Um, so here was one, uh, one little gift for me um, when we were still working on this notion of performance art. Um, and so now here we are in uh, the 2020 and 2021 season. And as with any choir in a virtual context this year, there are lots and lots of challenges. Um, but there are also silver linings. Um, for us with with Singable, um, some of the, the real challenges, I mean, just aside from not being able to be together and experience the joy that one ha that we have of singing together, um, uh, there's there's been um, uh, some difficulty to have staff support for our individuals to take part um, in this remote uh, manifestation of our rehearsals, um, difficulties with gaining access to technology. Um, and also there are uh, singing restrictions in the care facilities. And I just reached out today for um, to one of our, um, one of the staff members 
uh, from our local organization. And she, she has said that um, the instructions are that residents must sing with the mask on in their own rooms alone if they wanted to take part. And so you can see how much isolation that will bring. Um, also, of course, we can't really think about full-bodied singing. Um, and also there's a real tendency to focus on, focus on the visual. Uh, when, when we're working in this kind of uh, remote context. Um, but in terms of the silver lining, um, I, it's been really wonderful to um, get together every week. Um, obviously, our numbers are smaller this year, like many, many choirs right now. Um, but um, I found that within this remote context that um, I'm able to provide more individual encouragement and attention to members because they're on the screen, I can see what they're doing, and I can give them immediate feedback. Whereas if there's, you know, um, 80 of us in a room, I don't necessarily, uh, I'm, I don't really have the, the um, uh, uh, opportunity to really focus on ab absolutely every single person. Um, it's been really interesting to see uh, some of the individuals with disability in the choir. There seems to be a real desire to engage online that are independent of the, their caregivers or their staff members. And so they will have their device and they're very willing to, um, to comment on different things, to answer questions. And so there's this, this wonderful desire to engage. We have Zoom breakout room, kind of coffee breaks or conversations. And um, so we'll have smaller groups and that provides a more intimate connection. And there's also time to focus on some rudimentary uh, theoretical concepts when it comes to music and just basic things about how, how music is constructed. Um, and also there's a real hunger for everyone to interact with those outside of the care facility. And so at the end of our, end of our rehearsals, um, we spend a very long time waving goodbye to each other and saying goodnight to one another. And actually the same thing happens at the beginning of rehearsals, that there's real, um, real excitement to see one another. So those, there are the silver linings there, even though this is not an ideal situation. Um, some of the things that we've done now in our virtual, uh, our season three with the virtual stuff, we've had, we took a virtual choir tour, um, visiting some of these choirs, these inclusion choirs that I identified earlier in the, in the session today, we celebrated world singing day and had a community sing then, and also for music heals day in March, we had a virtual choir exchange with the momentum choir in, uh, in, uh, St. Catharines in Ontario. We're currently working on a virtual choir project, recording what a wonderful world. We share songs and then we have our Zoom coffee coffee break. So it just gives you an idea of what's happening this year. Our singable uh, project has kind of uh, move, moved Augustana into uh, embracing a number of pathways in terms of curriculum as well as with community outreach. Um, as I mentioned, Sing Able can be a course that students get credit for. And we also have just started uh, this year with a music and wellness course for senior, um, senior students in any discipline. And that's proven to be very popular. I'm teaching it right now, and I'm really um, enjoying that. I find it very cathartic um, during the time of COVID to teach that course. And then um, we also have, um, we, we have established a pedagogy and wellness hub where we have um, people coming in to talk about the relationship between um, uh, music and health, but then also to talk about pedagogy. And this fits with our, our revisions to our Bachelor of Music program. So um, I think that we are getting to the end and there'll be some time for questions. Um, we just have our Sing Able song and Roger's gonna hop onto the piano. And um, why don't we sing this together? There's, I just, we have actually eight verses to this song with a chorus and whatever, and but we're only going to to do one um, because there were about 80 people that we composed this piece together so um, anyway we're just going to do one verse and so we'll sing the the chorus and go to verse one which is here and then um, when we get to the repetition of the of the chorus again you're going to see that there's some harmony and so please go ahead and um, there's a descant for you sopranos out there and there's something for um, for um, the altos in the crowd and then also if you just wanted to sing the C instrument on the refrain. But let's um, sing this and then um, we'll entertain any kind of questions. So here we go. And breathe. We love to sing because we are able. We raise our voices proud and strong and we will sing to Without label, we are singers and 
this is our song. When I sing, I feel like I can fly up in the sky. We all have rhythm if we give it a good try. Bring your friends and family, come and join and sing. Oh, the songs we sing, such joy to bring. We love to sing because we are able. We raise our voices proud and strong. And we will sing together without label. We are singers. And this is our song. Thanks so much for your singing. Uh, thanks, Scott and Tom, for, for having, having us here. And uh, thanks to Roger for being here as well. So I'll stop sharing right, right now. Anyway. Great. Thank you so much, Ardell. That was fantastic. So much to think about. Uh, so many good feelings uh, coming out of that talk. I really appreciate that. Um, so we are a, a bit over time, but, um, yeah, as usual, sorry about that. usually, no, 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 it's fine. We, it's, we're, we're all at home and in, in our, in our, well, hopefully we're all comfortable at home anyway. We don't have too far to go to get in bed. Uh, <laughs> but I just want to say, um, uh, just for those who do have to leave, um, thank you uh, for coming again this evening and hopefully we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Um, on uh, April 7th, Wednesday, uh, we'll have, um, Gordon Fitzell here to talk about some of his music and, uh, and then, uh, I'll, I'll also mention that concert on Friday, um, and we'll welcome Roger back, um, to play actually that, that concert won't be live, but it'll be streamed out on Friday night. So I'll send out more information, but thanks everyone so much for coming. And I would like to take some time to answer some questions because, uh, some of you are still here and you're, we'll, we'll, we'll stick around for a while and have a conversation. So, um, anybody who'd like to, um, Tom is going to help me, um, Go ahead and post your question, or if you have, uh, um, and I can see some of you, so you can also just um, raise your, wave your hand, or put your your virtual hand up, and we'll try to um, we'll try to keep track of who's who's next. Um, well, and Scott, Scott, I just wanted to to um, thank some of the choristers from Sing Able. I can see that they're here, and actually, there's someone named Gracie Yelland who actually was one of my research assistants who was involved with that video, and so there she is waving. She's just finishing her uh, music education. Uh, she did a bachelor of music at Augustana, and now she's just finishing her music education degree. So it's lovely to see her as a as a research assistant from way back when. So thanks, Gracie. Thanks for being here. Okay, so any questions for Ardell? I have one if, if uh, mm. no one else does. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more. I was very curious. You, you had a lot of things that you had to skip by quickly, <laughs> but there was one thing you mentioned I was really curious about, which was um, uh, you mentioned that you were thinking about or that you had a graphic score um, project that unfortunately mm -hmm. wasn't able to to happen, but I'd love to hear more about that. Yes, yeah. So in in March, because um, always I, I like to do a composition project in the second in the winter term, and uh, so we wrote the Sing April song in 2019, uh, and then in 2020 we're going to do a graphic notation project where. Um, we um, had some art students, visual art students, who were part of our, our community service learning uh, uh, group that were supporting Singable. And so we bought canvases and we, um, we identified four, th four um, we, we wanted to base it on the elements, right? The earth, um, air, water, and fire. And so we were going to paint these canvases to represent the elements. And then we chose familiar songs, um, say, Wade in the Water, um, God's going to set this world on fire, whatever we had, we had uh, a number of familiar songs. That, and so what we thought would have been on our performance art, um, uh, project was that we would improvise, um, we would just do a free vocal improvisation or instrumental improvisation, looking at the canvas that was painted. Um, and that would be kind of Alan Marie Schaefer, where we would have things to represent. We'd kind of compose the sound that would represent the earth, the air, water, fire. And so we would, we would have an improvisation and then we would move into whatever kind of familiar song that would go along with that theme. And then we'd move on to the next element. And so it was going to be this epic, uh, singing the scores, so these graphic 
scores, but then moving into familiar pieces as well. And so this would, you know, um, th this would um, help with, and, and we actually have um, an individual in our choir who um, has a visual impairment. And so we wanted also um, for there to be some kind of texture involved with this graphic score, or whatever. And so it's going to be an epic project. And we're going to do it, I think, in 2023 now, or, tw or actually 2022. Um, that's because we have these scores that are absolute or scores, these, um, these canvases that are completely blank in our storage room and a whole bunch of paint. And so we're going to go back and, and um, do that. And I wanted to show them some of the, some of the scores of R. Marie Schaefer to show how voices, how our voices can um, re respond and that we can compose that together. So um, that's really great. Yeah. And it's such yeah. a, it's such an interesting um, sounding project. We, we often do that with students um, graphical score work because it really opens up um, different ways of thinking about musical structure and, uh, and also um, the relationship with the performer. So um, that sounds like a really neat project. I hope that 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 will have to be able to. I hope that will be able to happen. Um, so great. Yeah. Um, anybody else? And I, I think um, Tom mentioned there was a question by Becky. Let me go back up and see if I can find that. Um, yeah, and I see that Janet has uh, a has a question. Oh yeah, I see too. it here. So she says, "Thank you for such an interesting presentation. You mentioned blessing, so I wanted to ask um, if the program is religious, ba a re uh, has a religious background, or and if so, which faith?" No, it um, we uh, Augustana is a um, uh, uh, we, uh, it used to be a faith based institution, but now we're a secular U of A, uh, and so we like I bring in a wide variety of music. Sometimes we, we will do some music that maybe is connected to a, a Christian uh, background, but we also look at other other faiths as well, and so we kind of keep everything open um, as open as possible. That's a great that's a great um, question. The the blessing that we have is actually an Irish blessing may the road rise up to meet you may the wind be always at your back um and so so it's more um i mean it does mention mention god for sure but we we tend to you know keep things kind of neutral in that regard mm. okay yeah. um and i see that janet has a question about funding um and uh so um with the uh, International Kodai Symposium, we, um, as I mentioned, we ended up with quite a wonderful um, gift of a surplus. Um, one, one doesn't always expect after putting on a conference that you're going to end with. It was really, I, I, I created a doomsday budget for the conference and uh, we ended up getting many more people coming to that conference than we thought. And um, so anyway, we've had this pool of money um, that we have used for, for Sing Able and I have donated my time in the first year that Sing Able was um, in existence. And actually Roger as well has been very generous and donated his time. He's our musical support. Um, and so, you know, for in terms of tuition, it doesn't cost anything. We don't use uh, scores per se. We have everything up on PowerPoint. Um, and uh, so there's not really expense in that regard. Um, the expense actually is with our research students because I want to make sure that I'm employing um, and encouraging under our undergraduate students to be involved. And so um, over the last uh, three years, I've been able to hire uh, research assistants. And so that's where our funds have gone. Um, we also bought a number of um, percussion instruments um, for those who actually are nonverbal, those individuals. And then we also, um, you know, have some scarves and whatever to support whatever kind of movement activities we do. And so we, but we um, actually have been, it's been, and we also were able to get some grant money from our, the city of Camrose. Um, and so now our, our, our uh, conference pool of money is getting a bit depleted, but this last year has been, you know, with, with COVID, we haven't been able to really, we've been doing everything online. And um, there's a student here. She was here. Oh, Jessica is still there. We have another research assistant who's now currently helping out, Jessica Gauguin. And um, so she is she is benefiting from these funds. So I anticipate that we probably have another year um, that we can sustain this. And, and we just want to make sure that it is free for everyone. And, and maybe that, and so there'll be some grant writing that will have to happen down the road. Um, but right now we're still able to sustain um, without having to charge. And, you know, the, the Cameras Association for Community Living really, um, really um, uh, supports as well um, with some funding from their, from their organization. Okay, thank you so much. Um, other questions? Um, oh, I see a, 
It looks like a comment. Actually, Laurie, are you here? Would you like to speak your comment? That looks like a great comment. Maybe, maybe uh, Tom could unmute you. Okay. Hi, Ardell. Hi. Thank Hi, you. Laurie. That was fantastic. Um, such incredible power in singing. And if anyone can do it, it's you, Ardell. Thank you for, <laughs> for bringing out the, uh, the, the inspiration and the, the empowering nature of music in people's lives. Um, I just, you, you mentioned in your list of, of choirs, the uh, Chorale de l'Accueil Bonneau in Montreal. Mm -hmm. Yep. I actually was was hired to to go work with them for a week um, in Montreal in the Accueil Bonneau, um, and and this was a group of very interesting men. <laughs> they were all men, um, and uh, and all homeless, uh, or they had all been homeless. And at this point, uh, this was almost twenty years ago now, had. Uh, they, they had been hired to sing on a Celine Dion album uh, because they were getting to be so famous because they would yes. go to the Metro and they would put up yep. the hat and were at a point where they would get seven, an average of $1,700 in their hat within an hour. Um, and this is what lifted them out of homelessness. And, and it was amazing that the sound that they made and yes, these people were in some ways marginalized, but oh my goodness, when they put their minds to it, they could, they could yeah. sing with incredible power and that became their power and their, their, their raison d'être and their, their reason for, for getting lifted out of homelessness. Um, and so I, I, I thought your singable, sing able choir um, is is undoubtedly having the same impact in a lot of mm -hmm. of of choirs lives, um, maybe not in the same way, in different ways. But it's so um, it's so incredible that the inherent power of music and the human voice, when you mix that with community and so bravo for your fine work. I just yeah. wanted to. Oh to uh, to congratulate you on that. Thanks for your support, Laurier. Um, for those of you who, who, who may not know, Laurier is the uh, president of Choral Canada, the national uh, choral service organization uh, in our in our country. So that means the world to me, Laurier. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. And so wonderful that you worked with, with them, yeah. It was an interesting week, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. I think we have time for a question or two more if anyone has one. If anyone wants to join in on Tuesday nights, we have a Zoom link. <laughs> You're more, we have someone from Cold Lake, um, Joe Peterson, who's here on my bottom of my screen. She tunes in from Cold Lake. And so you're welcome to, to join in. And I also see that my colleague, Dr. John Weeb, who is the director of our choral program at Augustana, he's he's here on, on uh, the call as well. So thanks for being here, John. Tom, you mentioned Julia has, uh, but I didn't see it. Could you, and since you have a question, maybe you can unmute yourself and, um, oh, okay, there it is. There it is. Um, I don't know how many years I've been in Singable. What's the song you did when I walked into the ba Bailey Theater? <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, it would have been a Christmas song. Uh, the Bailey Theater is a performance venue, um, a very old, um, a old hall. It's probably what year would have go back to, like probably uh, like nineteen eleven or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we did a community sing there, and so this it would have been uh, Juliet would have been a a, a a Christmas a Christmas carol um, that we would have had at that at that occasion. So thanks for asking. Any anyone else? Uh, and actually, Becky had a comment here about Larsh Edmonton. She was wondering if Larsh um, had closed, um, and so I was still under the impression that it was that it was still open, but um, that could have changed. Um, you know, after all the difficulties that, you know, L'Arche was happening um, post-2019. So I should check into that and see. Okay, well, this has been fantastic. Um, 
and uh, I, I just congratulate you as well on, on great work and thanks for such a great talk. And uh, thanks everybody for joining us this evening. Um, let's give her a round of applause. And well, feel and free to turn on your video God. and give her a smile because that's thank you. She can't Scott, hear one thing the... that I <laughs> one thing that I hey. wanted to, to say, one thing I wanted to say, thank you so much for being here, everyone. And I like I do believe that with COVID, we um have great advocacy work that needs to be done when it comes to participation in music on the community level. And um I believe that the wellness piece has got to be um, key in advocating for the importance of music in, in our lives. And, and so actually for many of you might be interested, um, at the end of May um, at the University of Saskatchewan is um, hosting a music and well-being conference. Um, and so you might be interesting to check that out because uh, Daniel Levitin, who's a, a, a neuroscientist from uh, McGill University, um, he's going to be their keynote speaker. And uh, uh, really, if we're just thinking about reasons that we have to keep the music alive, I do believe that the wellness piece has got to be the got to be the the ticket to to um, recovering because it's going to take us a number of years for people to trust that they can go back and be part of a choir again especially when you think about elderly people um, and even if we think about our individuals who um, have been told that they can they should sing masked alone in their room you know and so it's going to take a while for people to feel comfortable about joining their voices together and so it's got to be this mm -hmm. this wellness piece I I believe. So okay, we'll look anyway. out for that. That sounds great. Yeah. Anyway. Um, thank okay. You it's everyone. been an honor. Um, and thanks oh, to all of you too. again for coming and um, have a great, uh, have a great rest of your evening. <laughs> thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your support. Thanks Tom and Scott. <laughs> no problem. Of course. Okay. Bye Julia. <laughs>